So welcome all to the fourth debate in the series, The Activist Museum, Going Deeper. Today we have with us Jessica Hallett, who's a curator at the Kalustkul Benkian Museum in Lisbon, and also the curator of the project Power of the Word, uh, which we will be discussing today. And also Susan ba Babai, professor at the Courtauld Institute of Art, whom we had the great pleasure of hearing at the um, uh, Gulbenkian Museum Summer School last uh, September. Thank you both for accepting our invitation. We finally managed to have this debate <laughs> after two <laughs> postponements, but we were really eager to, to have it. And um, it is a pleasure to be with you here today. Um, I went back to uh, hearing again uh, Susan's uh, presentation at the summer school and um, I checked my notes and I had written down that um, you said you're teaching art history that is more inclusive than the discipline normally taught in Europe. You teach art history with works of art and not about works of art. And you also drew our attention to the fact that display is discourse. And it is a discourse for which we're responsible and which is somehow it is imposed on those who look at the display. So instead of asking the really direct and obvious question, what is activism to you? And we'll discuss this. I would like to start with these notes I took from your presentation, Susan. Um, displays discourse and we have a responsibility because people come to museums and they trust museums. They trust what they read on the labels, they read on the panels. So would you like to talk to us a little bit more about this, this responsibility we have as professors of art history? Or, and uh, later, on, later on, we'll hear Jessica as well as, as curators, uh, the responsibility as curators mm. regarding our discourse. Yeah, thank you very much, first of all, Maria, for inviting me. <clears throat> and for pairing me with Jessica, <clears throat> with whom I work very closely and I'm delighted to be here. And, and thank, thanks to everyone who is here. Um, the, the subject of uh, display as discourse is something, I actually teach a course, a, a very first year BA entry level course called display as discourse. And um, and it focuses on looking at Persian arts at London collections. And the idea uh, behind this is what I learned as a student myself, which is when I was a, a student at Institute of Fine Arts of NYU, and that's at the Metropolitan Museum when I first met Jessica many years ago. Um, it was this, um, uh, this realization. I was part of the Islamic art department and a, a student fellow there, a graduate student fellow. It was this realization that when you entered the Metropolitan Museum of Art, that grand building and magnificent universal collection, that you went up a grand staircase and on top of it the zenith, the, the sort of apex of your journey was European arts right in front of you. And then to the right and to the left you might you know turn around and go to the wings where they would be you would be taken to ancient Near East or Asia and then to the farther uh, corners you would get to places like the Islamic world. And in those days, and that's not so long ago, it's only in the, in the uh, 1990s when you would in fact be going through um, to get to what used to be called primitive arts uh, was in the, the basement essentially or the lower sort of bowels of the museum. Uh, I remember as a student, this sense of um, the center and then the peripheries and then peripheries of the peripheries, if you will. Um, not that I managed to articulate any of this at the time, but it has always been part of my thinking as someone who teaches on uh, Islamic arts in general and uh, fields that have never been at the sort of the, never been canonical to history of art, 
uh, but always as sort of stepchildren, if you will. And so often uh, museums as well have treated these fields that uh, fall outside of the, um, the European centers and the canons as, um, as marginal. This is exceptionally not the case at the Golbenkian Museum, I must say, where the collection of Islamic arts is one of the strongest in that museum actually, and in that regard, very prominently placed. That, however, does not mean that the public comes in and seeks to go through the Islamic material right away. So there's something about the way in which we uh, use museums uh, to teach and to instruct the public about what is at the core of our understanding of culture, our culture, which is much more uh, multi-dimensional uh, than a single ethnicity or religion or language. And this is particularly important because museums are a legacy of 19th century primarily, but the world has changed dramatically now. And for us to be able to adjust and to still be the believable, reliable authority as the museums have become, uh, it is significant that we rethink our strategies of spaces to which we dedicate these um, sort of collectives of knowledge, whatever the case may be. So in many ways, I'm very sensitive. I'm an architectural historian, primarily, very sensitive to spatial arrangements. I'm very sensitive to how palaces are organized, how mosques are organized, how you see things, how you come to uh, the principal place of honor, so to speak. And so how we do the, the museum display is politically inspired and instructed even if you are not as the curator or the museum uh, a professional thinking in those terms. So now it is time to actively think about how we display things and what the messages are that, that our audiences um, uh, capture in those. One of its problems, and I think I'm, I'm going to stop and leave it at that until we have another opportunity, maybe, is the fact that there are, um, there are separate sections for separate parts, different parts, different parts of the world and cultures. And I find that very uh, uh, problematic in our world. Maybe it was fine. Uh, 50 years ago, but it no longer is fine to carry on like that. So we can come back to that one at another point. I hope I didn't take too much time to just say something. Not that at all. <laughs> it was, uh, and I, 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 I was thinking when you talked about the Kulbenkian Museum and uh, where the, we find the Islamic art, maybe because it is uh, presented, the collection is presented in, in uh, chronological order. <laughs> you know, we start with the Egyptians, then the Greeks, then the Islamic art, then Europe, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, that's how I always, it was always in my mind, arranged. I don't know. But that's also related to what the collection owns, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah. so there are more uh, or equally ancient material mm -hmm. that are the antiquities of what is in the Islamic gallery. And we have mm -hmm. no idea about them usually yeah. in the museums. That separation between the antiquities of places that we now attribute to Islamic art mm. collections, yeah. those antiquities have been separated from their Islamic continuities. And that's a real issue, actually. Yeah. Really good that you brought this up. Um, I'll pick up on something you said to move on to Jessica. You said the museum has become a believable, reliable authority. And I want to pick up on the word authority because a curator is an authority within the authority. It's somebody who makes decisions, even if they don't assume them to be politically driven. I'm not talking in partisan terms, politically yeah. driven. 
So how do you feel in this role, Jessica? How do you understand, how do you assume this responsibility as a curator in a museum of art? By questioning myself, uh, that's the starting point for me. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, the project that you see, Power of the Word, in, in the gallery now is the beginning of a question. And uh, so I question, you know, what I know, what I'd like to know. I question my limits. I question also my biases. It's been clear also that I was educated at a particular moment under a particular set of ideas. And so I try and uh, look at those, uh, those issues and then to look out to society and to see how I uh, can open myself up so that I can bring uh, more uh, to the collection. So the project Power of the Word, uh, the idea is that if you stand at the steps of the Gulbenkian Museum, you can see the minaret, the Samara style spiraling minaret of the great mosque of, or the, the, the city mosque of Lisbon. And uh, so it seemed important that uh, that gallery was uh, a place that people who are our neighbors uh, could find to be a place that they might call home or a place that they could visit. And so I wondered how we could engage, you know, them. And I wanted to do it in a way which was uh, democratic. Um, I hope I don't use that word, I mean, too strongly, but I wanted to do it in a way in which we could engage as equals together around the table and around objects out of cases. And so um, I invited a group of, uh, through uh, our education department, who are absolutely fabulous, uh, we invited a, a group of people to, to start working with us. They brought their languages. Uh, and we brought the objects and together we came around them and we began deciphering the inscriptions on objects which for most visitors to the gallery are indecipherable because they don't know Arabic or Persian. And it, it was the beginning of Power of the Word. And uh, the first one was uh, we did uh, an exhibition on pilgrimage, we did then one on moral stories, and then we did uh, the one most recently um, on women. And uh, each time we are growing the group, we are um, assessing, you know, where we are, where we'd like to go next. We don't repeat anything. We try to do everything new and fresh. And we try especially to make ourselves uncomfortable from the start to choose uh, areas that put us in discomfort. Um, mm. Because I've discovered through the process that actually we have a lot to gain as curators and as a museum uh, by, um, by putting ourselves in positions of discomfort. So uh, by admitting that maybe, mm. you know, we, we have a lot to learn still, you know, being humble, basically being, being humble. humble. I wanted to ask you specifically about that. I was preparing the question about the discomfort. Is there something um, that comes to your mind? I don't want to take you by surprise, but something you could share with us about a moment, a situation where you felt this kind of healthy discomfort during the project? Oh, I can tell you it happens. Uh, uh, the the, the last two times it's happened, both times, which is that uh, the ideas for this project are coming because I'm uh, trying to be, I mean, and I, I, I tell you that I mean, as much as I can, I mean, I'm trying to be attentive to what is happening in the city of Lisbon. So in the beginning, I was working, I thought, with the Muslim community, but we quickly abandoned that because we realized, actually, we're not working with a community. We're working with people who speak languages mm -hmm. and they are residents and nationals. They're also Portuguese and have those languages. So, so then the theme started coming from them, um, coming from where I could see there was a connection outside the museum. In other, I, I, I heard one of your discussions where somebody talked about outreach. Well, I guess I would say I'm trying to do in-reach. In-reach. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Uh, bringing, um, so the discomfort is, for example, to choose a theme like women and not even to know where to go in your collection to find women. I mean, beyond the obvious, which is, mm. you know, images of women, you know. So that's a, a frightening thing to embark on something where you really don't know where you're going to go. But um, fortunately in that project, we work with Shad Wadi, who is, uh, you know, a brilliant uh, academic, a feminist, a Palestinian. And she was able to shape the question so that I was then able to do the research. And mm. 
in the process to learn enormously about our collection. Um, and I have to say that the, the only drawback of power of the word is that, you know, it's very, very time consuming, these kinds of processes. If you can imagine that you're trying to engage, learn, develop trust, talk, research, put all this together in different ways and then share it with the public in the gallery, um, that in fact, I'm finding that there's not time to publish. So, mm, yeah. <laughs> so the scientific role of the curator is sometimes needs to be uh, sacrificed if you want to develop this kind of, this kind of participatory uh, yeah. practice. But it's important also to find the time to, you know, write things down and share them widely. Uh, but I understand, yeah, there's no time for everything. Um, many people feel uncomfortable uh, in getting into the museum, not just the Kulbenkian Museum, many museums. Mm -hmm. in, in the case of the Kulbenkian Museum, there's this beautiful garden and yes. everybody knows, I mean, people working for the foundation, they know that people walk around and enjoy the garden, but they wouldn't go in. Yes. Did the, let's say, the, 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 the Muslim community come in and we, I have, community is not one thing, it's not a homogeneous thing. Did people that hadn't come before come to see this display? And do you know how they reacted to it and to the stories that are presented there? Um, well, actually, we, uh, I did an exhibition called The Rise of Islamic Art, which mm. uh, Susan saw, perhaps some people in the audience also saw. And so that was really a challenge for me because I, um, I work on you know medieval mainly or early Renaissance. And I was asked to do an exhibition which put Gulbenkian's uh, collection in geopolitical context. So I had to come up against really difficult uh, uh, words and language and uh, uh, and I, I worked that through, we can come to that again, but um, the, we had 113 uh, Muslims, I mean, uh, Muslims from the mosque come and visit that exhibition. And it was actually through their enthusiasm for it that then we developed, um, that we developed power, power of the word. Um, and what I have noticed in the gallery is that um, uh, it's a real, for me, what's, uh, we are trying to bring together the voices of the group that we work with, with alongside a curatorial voice. Um, and so it's important that the group recognizes themselves in the project, uh, but we also leave it open. And one of the things that I think, you know, it's not, I don't believe in perfection in the project. There's no perfection. We're not looking for, in fact, imperfection can also be interesting. And, um, and so what I'm seeing is that people are engaging with it. They converse around it. Um, we're seeing this mainly among our usual visitors. And, um, and of course, you know, the project at various moments when we have events, like this or, or other types of events, of course, we're seeing that people are coming online and joining us and joining mm -hmm. us in the museum. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that it has been uh, successful in, uh, in more people feeling uh, that they want to come to the museum uh, more regularly, but yeah. certainly they want to come and see it once, you know, they want to come and see Power of the yes. Word once. Um, so um, I'll go to the obvious question. Uh, do you see yourselves as activists? through the work you do. There are many ways of defining activism and some people are not even comfortable with the word. But I remember once in a conference, somebody uh, showed us a film with John Berger and John Berger in that very short film told us that uh, listening is activism. Mm -hmm. We start from there. So mm -hmm. how do you define activism and do you see yourselves as activists through the work you develop, either at the university or the museum? Susan? Yeah, um, uh, I mean, we are activists by very uh, nature of the work we do, which is interventionist. What Jessica was talking about uh, are a series of interventions he, she has made in the museum by way of the collection, rethinking the collection, um, curating new exhibitions, new ways of, of displaying the objects. And uh, that's a form of activism. And every time I show up in a classroom, or I take my students to a museum, that is a form of activism. You are making interventions. And, and I think one of the key points is, uh, as Jessica was, was describing this, 
the key point is to really um, effect some change. And, and that is uh, the result of, it's not, a, it's not a political statement, although everything is political, of course, but that to effect change in some form or fashion for, um, for what we understand to be for the positive, for the better, in fact, is a form of activism. And I think uh, what Jessica was describing in, in rethinking the collection, bringing new, uh, new um, urban communities, new uh, um, layers of Portuguese society of Lisbonites into the museum uh, is really affecting change. And I feel that, you know, the fact that I, I was beneficiary of, a, of a, um, an opportunity a few years ago before Jessica took the helm at the Golbenkion. Done of, brilliantly, by the way. <laughs> well, thank you for that one. And, and to bring my students to, to curate together with the, uh, with the museum staff um, two different installations, and and that's an intervention in the in that space of the Islamic galleries, and it you know it has reverberations. Jessica was talking about you know bringing people from the mosque, from the city. Those are waves that little waves maybe imperceptible maybe, but they have consequences. They plant seeds in the minds of especially younger people and to target uh, those kinds of changes is a form of activism. That's my job, I, I teach. So all I do is try to sort of plant seeds and those seeds do bear fruit. I mean, um, it's, there's no better reward than watching your students go out there and make changes in the museums or in, in scholarship and knowledge production. This is not minor matter. This is about producing new knowledge that is then passed on to others. And I think the power of the word of which I have seen one iteration only and the exhibition that Jessica put together of that, um, the, uh, the Golbenkion as a, a, a collector at the center of a global way of thinking about Islamic arts, these are, um, these are ways of, of producing new knowledge, which upon which then um, other things are built. And I think that's, that's activism. I, I don't know what else to call it, really. Yes. Sometimes it's yes. radical interventions, too. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I was thinking now what I learned through this uh, uh, Power of the Word 3. Uh, I think that I had never heard anyone talking about Mrs. Kulbenkian before. Never. <laughs> never. It's the first time. And also my surprise, it's one of the last exhibits in the case, where they say that European women uh, saw the freedom in Muslim women wearing pants, and then pants came to Europe. Uh, and that's what was another thing that I took away with me and that made me think, do you see yourself as an activist, uh, Jessica, within Actually, the organization you work for? Yes. Um, well, I've done some soul searching, having been asked to be part of part of this. And I would say that I don't regard myself as an activist. Um, uh, the reason that I say this is that, you know, the word activist is coined, as we know, around the First World War, and it has a certain, uh, a certain meaning at that time, um, which, um, uh, which if I can just, you know, quote what I had here, you know, in my in my, in my notes, which is, you know, this, in the sense that a person who advocates or engages in action, especially that undertakes vigorous political or social campaigning. <laughs> so um, now I have to say, I'm a, I'm a woman who spent her youth traveling in India and the Middle East, exploring all different kinds of things. And, 
you know, uh, in the path of Mahatma Gandhi, Nelson Mandela, of course, is a great man of, of my youth as well. Uh, there are people like that for whom I, I treasure the word activist. So I feel like uh, I'd like to, in the framework of power of words, I would like to keep that word for those people who are, who are sometimes unnamed also, who are really at the edge uh, especially Indigenous people in Canada and Indigenous people also in Brazil and places like that. I feel strongly that they really deserve to carry the power of that word forward with their with the work that they do. I mean, really dedication, selfless dedication, sacrifice, uh, fighting for change. So, um, so I don't consider myself uh, an activist uh, because of I would like to define it like way, that way. That's a personal choice and yeah. uh, for me. Um, I must say that what really motivates me in my work um, is to counter uh, racism and the negative stereotypes that have been hanging over us uh, inside the field of Islamic art for many decades. And so in that sense, I am an activist and we are all activists in the discipline of Islamic art. And I have a, a text here that I, that I brought with me and I'll just, I'll just read it quickly for you just as a kind of ending thing and just see if you can guess when this was, when this was written. What does the word Islam bring to mind? Perhaps images of graceful domes and minarets, Lawrence of Arabia, women who wear veils and can be divorced at will. A fanatical, fatalistic religion, a holy war against the West. And then there's another few lines and then it ends, and this is the beginning of an exhibition pamphlet. This exhibition attempts to give an insight into a complex world, bringing the historical achievements of Islam into better perspective as a way of promoting understanding. I don't know, Susan, would you like to be challenged to tell me when you think somebody, <laughs> one of our colleagues wrote this? <laughs> so, so the thing that is not clear is, is that opening sort of challenging the, the media and public assumptions about Islam? Yes, that's and, the, yeah, that's the yeah, intention. And that, that at the end, the claim is that I'm going to change your mind because Muslims aren't like that, right? Mm -hmm. Something to that effect. No, I don't want to name names, but but I can see where you're going. But you know, to just match your your bit, and I want to know who it is by. No, no, <laughs> it I is. just want you to know that this is written 35 years ago. This is yeah. written when I was an undergraduate. So, yeah. you know, these words of oppression, like these dark words of oppression and violence, like all of us have had to face that. So it's it's hard for us in this field not to feel that we need uh, to, to really uh, try our best to make a difference. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, uh, I, I think you are familiar with this too. There, there was an exhibition of Persian arts in London, the very first exhibition of Persian arts at the, at the South Kensington Museum in which the catalog entry, and we won't name names, they are known to the, to the experts in the field. Uh, one of the statements in there is, is something, and I paraphrase, that, that Persian uh, artists um, uh, don't understand anything intellectually uh, deep. They have a love of surface uh, elaboration and, <laughs> and color. I think and I know. <laughs> oh, the point being that there is no mind behind any of this, that this is all repetition of things that are crafted, that they are traditions that you continue without having any sense of innovation, any sense of uh, a meaning beyond what is on the surface of things. The late Oleg Grobar made the first attempt at giving some sense to what has always been thought of as frivolous ornament. And that mm -hmm. has been one of the key ways that people have thought about Islamic arts. And I remember a student years ago who wanted to study Mughal art and, and her primary supervisor said no she will end up talking about carpets 
that was the you know that was the put down you can't go into islamic arts because you end up talking about carpets as if talking about carpets now we have the expert here jessica <laughs> talking about carpets is mindless frivol frivolous ornamental things these are real issues and that that oh, actually is not 30 years ago that's about maybe 12 years ago when i <laughs> watching this happen in front of my eyes. So the point is really that, that, and I go back to activism and I think it is activism. I'm not at all the activist political formulation that you were referring to, Jessica. Uh, but I do think that when you stick your neck out to say, wait a moment, carpets are worth studying. That, that ornament is not about nothingness and just, you know, mindlessness. That you are not just looking at beautiful domes and minarets, but that you are really looking at meaning making, at very politically, socially, culturally, religiously, emotionally invested artistic products. That's activism. And, and to, I mean, Jessica knows this. We are in the business of defending. We are always on defense. <laughs> so, so you are as if you're always under attack. And yeah. really, it would be great one day not to feel like you're under attack. And exactly. then you can just do what you need to do and be accepted <laughs> as such, right? Yeah. So that's what I meant about marginal versus central, mm -hmm. canonical versus non-canonical. Mm -hmm. Things are changing dramatically, as it were, now, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and especially in academia. This is really important to make a note of, that mm -hmm. a lot of change is coming out of these corners of what we think of as sort of arcane of scholarship. But, but people are making serious changes, and it's well worth beginning to merge the two sides, because the power of the museum uh, articulating new ways of thinking through uh, display, through mm -hmm. the juxtaposition of objects, mm -hmm. thinking about, I mean, I would love to walk into a museum where a piece out of the Islamic collection and a piece out of the French 18th century doorknobs are put next to one another, mm -hmm. not to mention great paintings, for instance, right? So that, that's an intervention that is on the level of throwing these surprising sort of stop and think again about a depiction of human figure on a, in a Persian painting in comparison to a Chinese painting and a European. You'll be very pleased to know that we are developing an Erasmus Mundus curation program here. Fabulous. Then, and we have uh, students from China, Malaysia, Ireland, and three from Portugal. And they have just done something like that across the collection. And <laughs> uh, all by themselves. I mean, we did it uh, in a very, not this isn't the time to tell you how we did it, but it's been t terrifically exciting. And uh, if there's a secret to the way that I work is that I, you know, I always engage with young people between, you know, 15 and 30. I find them incredibly stimulating and interesting. And I also engage with people over 80 because I also find that they have a lot to share yep. uh, after so many years of experience of watching museums change over the course of their lifetime. So yep. I figure great. if we can attract the young ones and attract uh, the <laughs> wise ones, yep. then uh, we're doing a good job in our museums. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's great. I can't wait to come and see that. <laughs> it's actually going to be online. So I'll share the, share the link. Thank that's you. Great. That would be fabulous. <laughs> uh, a little while ago, when I was listening to Jessica discussing the, the word activist, the, defini the definition mm -hmm. of activism, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I understand why you feel humbled by the word and why you want mm -hmm. to preserve mm -hmm. it for certain people. Many mm -hmm. times, though, I think that if museums want to bring some change, mm -hmm. if, you, if they want to help people mm -hmm. make changes mm -hmm. that are necessary, mm -hmm. we have to deal with the fact that people many times feel very small in front of big issues. In, mm -hmm. in society, in the world. 
and mm -hmm. how can we make them feel empowered? And I got mm -hmm. a lesson from a museum. I mm -hmm. was at the National Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, and there is a, after we visit the exhibition, there's mm -hmm. a last beat that is called, how can we avoid genocide? Yes. And the first point is, know about it, be informed about it. And then mm -hmm. the second point is, uh, let other people know. Inform, mm -hmm. you know, share this knowledge with other mm -hmm. people. This is the mm -hmm. first and second point before mm -hmm. we move into the, how do you say, the vigorously involved mm -hmm. political campaign, etc. Mm -hmm. So maybe we should start, we, we, sh we should see the scale of things and how each one of us can make a change mm -hmm. within their own immediate environment. And we need to help people feel that, that they're not powerless in front of the big issues and each one of us can do, you know, their, their small bit. Um, and perhaps, yeah, I, I really want to believe that museums can do that, can do at okay. least that. <laughs> um, I would like to open up to our, uh, to the people who are with us today. We have another 20 minutes, so please turn, turn on your cameras and feel free to share your thoughts on uh, what you heard so far, ask questions. It would be nice to see your faces now. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> yeah, we'll be more now. Robert, would you like to say something? Yes, please. Yes, I would. I'd like to ask a question of uh, Susanna and Jessica. I'm wondering, do you find that your institutions, that the hierarchy, that your bosses constrain or restrain you and your ability to, uh, and your, your opportunity to be activists? Is this an institutional commitment or are you both flying under the radar? <laughs> Very good question. Good question. <laughs> Actually, I have to say that I thought um, that uh, when I started, I didn't know what I was doing. So I was flying under the radar because um, I, I was really experimenting and I was really uh, putting myself um, out there to try and do something. And the reality is that along the way, in three years uh, or two years that we've been doing it, I have discovered that um, I have the support of my institution. And I have the support now of two directors. And I have never had a criticism, a negative criticism about what I'm doing. So I regard myself also to be in a space of peace in that respect. Um, it has been difficult uh, to sometimes overcome other aspects. I mean, I'm talking about practical aspects. Um, for example, some people are concerned that I'm developing uh, rotating exhibitions in what is a permanent gallery. So there's that been that kind of thing, but nothing about engaging in the way that I'm engaging, nor in having the words of the people that I'm working with inside the museum. Uh, we even had a panel which had quotes from the group in the second one. So, um, and uh, I feel, um, that in many ways, uh, I think that I should have really um, had more confidence when I started, because if you look at the profile of the Gulbenkian and where it puts its money, it is putting its money into these kinds of things elsewhere. And just a few weeks ago, the Gulbenkian gave a very large grant to the Barbican to develop a civic uh, arts uh, project working with the local community and its local talent. So what I'm doing here is actually very much um, in, 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 in the, the philosophy, really, of, of the Gulbenkian. Uh, what's new, of course, is, as I say, trying to uh, manage um, things inside the gallery and trying to uh, work with different ways of display. And, you know, it's, we did the first podcast ever and things like that. So, you know, there, those are real uh, challenges to, uh, but in terms of working with a group and being open to it, uh, I'm very happy with where I am right now and where we all are. Hmm. And this is so, something new. Sorry, Susan, just to no, no. I, I uh, just follow wanna, up. Yeah, I, yeah if, if I may just answer yes, yes. Uh, that same question, the situation for academics is of course different, and and uh, for um, I I teach and work in a self governing uh, institution, and I'm part of the self governing structure, so to speak. So academic environment has, uh, has greater uh, room for flexing muscles, intellectual muscles, if you mm -hmm. will, 
in directions that you don't have to uh, be as alert to the image vis-a-vis uh, -vis the public or vis-a-vis -vis the, the donors and so forth, which I know museums have a, have a different um, burden on them. Uh, we, on the other hand, in a way are actually uh, responsible for creating opportunities for students to develop new thoughts and new directions. And, and that's really always encouraging. So this is not under the radar by any stretch of the imagination, uh -huh. quite in the open. Uh -huh. uh, but also what is really interesting is the fact that um, it in fact is called for that uh, that academic environment is looked at to contribute to these debates. And I think that's really important. In other words, one thing that I find uh, very productive is these cross-institutional uh, dialogues and debates, exactly what, what Maria has set up here um, to bring academic uh, uh, involvement and the museum involvement to speak to each other and to work together, actually. Uh, something that uh, museums here are also doing. I was recently in a, in a podcast with the director of the um, Fitzwilliams and director of the National Gallery. And it was about um, what, are, what are the responsibilities of museums in the context of the nation, actually? What does it mean? to be a national museum. And, and that is really the kinds of crisscrossing of thinking that should be happening more and more as it were. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Susan. Mm -hmm. Anyone else that would like to ask a question or make a comment? Yes, Maggie. Hi, um, thank you so much for this uh, thought provoking discussion. So I have a question. Um, this has just made me think about the, in the role of a curator as an activist, um, the kind of visibility or invisibility of the curator. So just thinking about how traditional models of curation tend to obscure the active role of the curator presenting exhibitions and displays as kind of authorless truth. So, you know, we have just the text that almost emerges out of the wall with no author um, and that curators names are often like perhaps listed somewhere on a text panel, but usually not at all. Um, so I wonder if this model of the curator as an activist necessitates greater visibility of the curator themselves. Thank you. Who would like to answer Maggie's questions? Can I just yeah. say something about, about the fact that Maggie is one of those people who are really pushing the boundaries uh, by looking at things. She's one of my PhD students. I'm very proud of, of these students who are here too. But that pushing the boundaries of thinking about not only the scholarly aspects, um, but also the, the sort of the structures of production of knowledge, of museum curating, those kinds of issues. And it's a really important point she raises uh, nowadays. I mean, it used to be that you got a master's or a PhD or even before that, just enough to have had a BA and you were the curators and oftentimes the anonymous face behind everything. Now you can actually get degrees in curatorial training and get a PhD in, in becoming a curator. It seems like a whole different, uh, a different uh, structure has emerged uh, foregrounding the role of the curator as, as cultural producer, in fact, in so many ways now. So that's the only thing I wanted to add. Thank you, Maggie, for po pointing this important uh, issue. Um, I think it's really interesting what you say. And um, uh, in fact, when I did the Rise of Islamic Art, just to come, to come back to that, um, uh, 
the opening text, which discussed, you know, what is Islamic art, it ends with a question, basically. And, and so uh, I'm trying more and more, uh, as there is this anonymous voice there, to let people know that that anonymous voice is not a perfect voice. It uh, is, uh, and that there are a variety of possibilities, that we are still debating these issues, uh, that more is to come. Uh, also to encourage people to explore in the future or when they go home, you know, to, and to keep their, their minds open. That's what's really important for me. Um, and so I try as much as possible to bring the process of what we're doing or the way that I'm thinking and to my labels so that then to get people to, to question themselves. And what I am seeing with Power of the Word now is it's actually happening, people actually discussing things in front of the case. Mm -hmm. but, um, but for example, uh, with the, the rise of Islamic art, putting uh, you know, our, our Islamic collection in geopolitical context, that was really difficult for me. I mean, I'm not trained in the 19th century. I'm not trained in 19th century history and politics and early 20th century. So it was really like a learning curve. But I really tried to work with objects to see how I could bring some very complex, difficult ideas like colonialism, like genocide, uh, like racism, that I could bring those things, like not to shy away from those words, but to find objects that would allow people to engage with those words inside the exhibition context. And what was so interesting about that exhibition is that we discovered that the public was ready for that. They, they mm. wanted that. And that's the brilliance of, of Penelope Curtis in this project because she recognized that the time was right for an exhibition um, like that. Mm. And um, so having that, that exercise has really, has really helped me um, to, to be less afraid and to be more experimental. And I did something that you might think is absolutely insane, but in power of the word women, I actually wrote from the perspective of the object, which is something that, you know, is considered, would be considered to be a complete no-no or whatever. But I thought, you know, I'm looking for all different kinds of voices. Uh, let me play as a, as a fictional object. And let's see what the reaction of the public is if I, you know, if I play that role, how do they mm -hmm. react to it? What was so fascinating is that when people reviewed, and you can go and look at the display online, there are three voices for every object okay. in the project part. And one voice is the, is, you know, the, the, the boring curator voice. One is the, the person in the group's voice. And the other voice is the voice of the object. And in fact, people really enjoyed the voice of the object because they, they, those texts almost managed to bring out even more the feminist aspects of the object. So, um, so just to say that uh, experimentation is very healthy, I think. And I think trying not to get too serious with being uh, uh, perfect, trying to be perfect and to give uh, conclusive uh, information um, to the public. Thank you, Jessica. The power of the word is online. Uh, just to let uh, our the friends who, who are here with us today and don't live in Portugal, that uh, you can find all this online and the podcast, etc. It's quite quite complete. Uh, it makes you want to come to Lisbon after that. So <laughs> I have to warn you. Yes. Uh, Elenia would like to ask a question. Yes, if my cat lets me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Very nice. Um, so Lots well, of cat to... lovers here. Yeah, a, a lot of. <laughs> so yeah. what I wanted to ask is, how do you negotiate with different perceptions of heritage? I explained a little bit, a little mm -hmm. bit better. Um, last summer, I had um, a fieldwork ex experience in another part of, of Italy, mm -hmm. which involved um, an archaeological site Mm -hmm. And where we tried also to engage with the whole community of, mm -hmm. of the town belonging to this site. Mm -hmm. And some people replied that they had already known that site for other, re for other reasons, but they were not interested in archaeology. And these are the reasons where, among others, um, looking for mushrooms, for example. And that's heritage as well. It is, it is mm -hmm. not that the site is less important to them because it's, they don't acknowledge the archaeological importance of the site, mm -hmm. but it's just a different perception of the same place and different usage of the same place. Mm -hmm. So how would you negotiate with that in a museum setting or in a cultural heritage setting? 
I would engage with it. I would definitely. Yeah, me, yeah, me too. <laughs> I would definitely engage with it. In fact, I'll tell you something absolutely fascinating happened in the first power of the word. Um, basically, we were working, uh, as I told you, you know, we were exploring these objects which have Quranic inscriptions and things like that. And we developed this, uh, this narrative, they did. I mean, with their keywords, they developed a, a narrative for pilgrimage. And uh, in the group was um, a queer curator from Lebanon who, uh, just, I mean, just queer curation, and he wanted the keyword to be um, coexistence. And so inside the project, we then, it was wonderful. He brought that word and we brought it into the project and it was fantastic. And then at the end, um, a young imam uh, said, actually, I can read this spiritually for you from the opposite direction, not from the way you have set it out with your words from left to right, but according to Arabic script, as if I am reading the Quran, I can give you a Quranic. And so in the end, I did, or we did together, two labels. One label describes the exhibition we created as a group, and one gives the spiritual interpretation that he made. And I don't know if, you know, if every museum would do that. I mean, that would allow that to happen. But um, that was the very first project. And I felt that it was just extraordinarily creative of him in that moment with spontaneity, just I felt he was really giving something rich from inside him. And so I really wanted it to be there. So uh, I, I, I'm very keen to have all voices um, present. The next uh, power of the word will be on spirituality. We'll be working with Sufism and poetry. I think that this is a very beautiful thing to engage with poetry at this very difficult moment that we're in with COVID. And uh, then after that, we'll work with science. But then I hope that the group will be uh, young people, not adults. So I'd like to have ambassadors in our school system who are able to share, you know, Islamic science and understand why it is that we call Arabic numerals Arabic numerals and what it is that um, the Islamic world brought to Europe in the Renaissance that's part of, you know, the science we practice today. That's great. So. We are reaching the end. Anybody else that would like to say something, share something with us? Uh, it was a beautiful conversation and I'm really glad we finally managed to <laughs> make it. Yes. I apologize also to the people who are with us. We postponed it twice, but we managed. It was it was beautiful. It was inspiring. Um, and I thank you both, Jessica and Susan. And thank we you. should uh, we should not forget our colleague, Susana Gomez da Silva, whose exactly. idea was to bring it together. Oh, yes. uh, and, uh, yeah, it was, and it was Diana really nice. Also is part of the and Diana, she's part of the yes. project, of course. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. I would like to thank all of you for being with us today. And for the first time, I can tell you when the next The Activist Museum debate is, because we're very <laughs> close now. It will be on the 13th of January. And we'll have with us Armando Perla, who's a curator and academic from El Salvador and who now lives and works in Canada, and also Maria Acasso, who works for the Reina Sofia Museum in Madrid. So it's the 13th of January, same time, 6.30 Western European time, and I hope to see some of you there. Have a beautiful holiday, all of you, peaceful, uh, virusless <laughs> as possible, uh, and uh, enjoy, enjoy with your family and friends and all those you love. Thank you so much. Thank again. you. Thank you very Bye. much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. You. Bye. <laughs>